Maybe some of you are wondering what's uh, the relevance uh, of my intervention with cultural diplomacy in the EU and the topic of the today's uh, symposium. I believe it's quite relevant and I will try to present this to you. But let me start by pointing out a key phrase which is in the title of the symposium, moving towards a European consensus. How can you build a European consensus with so many actors around the table, with so many conflicting interests? I believe uh, the answer is simple. You start by closing the gap between perception and reality. And this brings me to the case of Cyprus. A few days before the assumption of the rotating presidency of the European Union, of the Council of the European Union, namely in June 2012, the government of Cyprus was forced to apply for financial assistance from the European Union. And I'm saying that uh, we were forced because we were late. Maybe not too late, <laughs> time will show. So why did Cyprus find itself in this situation? Why did mm, it took us nine months to apply for this, for this um, uh, financial support? The Cyprus uh, problems built up over many years. Their origin was the oversized banking sector and the banking problems um, were aggravated by poor practices of risk management and also of lacking oversight. Uh, because of the, of the lack of oversight, the largest uh, banks of Cyprus, the two banks of Cyprus, built up uh, excessive risk exposures. Just to give you an example, uh, they invested in the Greek market to the extent that when the PSI for Greece was decided back in October 2011, Cyprus banks lost 4.5 billion euros. That uh, is 25% uh, of our GDP. We got uh, a number of warnings from the European Commission and other European actors already in 2011. However, we failed to see the bigger picture we address the issue of liquidity. We managed, although Cyprus was not in the markets, uh, uh, we managed to, s to address the problem of liquidity by getting a loan from Russia of 2.5 billion, which uh, helped us to continue for another 15 months. So it was very unfortunate for us, especially us in Brussels, because it was a Brussels-based presidency to ask for this uh, financial support just a few days before the assumption of the presidency. And I'm now coming to this perception. Uh, I don't know how much you know about my country. Uh, Cyprus is a small island in the Mediterranean, divided since 74. Um, there was a plan, there were many plans uh, through the years to solve the Cyprus problem. But one plan which uh, was put uh, in a referendum in 2004, just one week before our accession, created another perception, namely that the Greek Cypriots wanted to safeguard their accession to the European Union, but did vote against uh, the United Nations plan. So the perception in the European Union, or in some circles, was that uh, <coughs> Cyprus uh, was uh, one issue member state, namely Turkey and the Cyprus problem. And uh, now, uh, because of the economic problems and uh, having a small uh, administration, not to forget the distance, it's about four hours from uh, uh, Brussels by plane. Um, people had uh, their doubts about our effectiveness uh, uh, during our presidency. So you can imagine that uh, this request for financial uh, support made things even more challenging for us. Because our goal has been always uh, to show that Cyprus is a committed European and is a credible partner. I think at the end, and uh, I'm not the one uh, who is saying this, 
we did succeed to prove to our partners and to the key players here in the European Union that Cyprus is a normal member state like any other. Um, we are credible pa partners and you can rely on us um, because during the six months of the presidency, we did try to be objective. We did try to put forward the European interest and not to uh, um, um, uh, s seek the, the national the, 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 the national interest of Cyprus. Uh, during the Cyprus presidency, I'm giving you an example, we did decide for the first time at Corebell level the conclusions of <laughs> Turkey and on enlargement uh, with the agreement on everybody. So the ministers had uh, an easy job to do. And that is, it was because, as I said, we are very objective. So um, the objective of the support uh, for a support program was um, to preserve financial stability in Cyprus, but also in the European Union, in the Eurozone. The delays, the indecisiveness, and the very firm financial constraints limited at the end the options which were available before. So although Euro, members, uh, Euro area member states were ready to commit support up to 10 billion euros, which is uh, about uh, two thirds of our GDP, Cyprus was expected to mobilize substantial internal resources to cover the remainder of these financing needs through a number of fiscal measures and by sharing the burden with the creditors of its banking sectors, uh, around 6 billion euros. So um, the scenario, as I said, because of that delay, the scenario of the gradual economic adjustment was not an option any longer in March. The second biggest bank, Laiki, had to be resolved immediately. The Eurogroup decision was quite harsh for the people of Cyprus and for the business community. But uh, it was because uh, of the delay, because of the political agenda in Cyprus, because we had elections, but also in some other member states, and because of this IMF uh, precondition about the debt sustainability. So that means that uh, the Troika couldn't offer to Cyprus a bigger amount, and that's why we had to find this six billion. But um, there are analysts who say that Cyprus was treated the way it was treated because of the perceptions that exist also about Cyprus, namely money laundering, the Russian oligarchs, um, all these reports in the German media, um, and as I said before, uh, the, our vote in the referendum. So um, the Eurogroup decision of March 25th was extremely detrimental for our economy and the people of Cyprus. The real economy is now in deep recession. It's expected to worsen in 2014. The unemployment, which a few years back was 3%, now reached 17%. Uh, we expect a contraction of our economy up to 12 to 14 percent in the next few years. The restrictive measures on capital movements uh, are still in place um, because of the fear of outflows. And uh, despite some uh, relaxation, progressive relaxation in these measures, uh, they remain an impediment in restoring confidence in Cyprus economy. And they think. Uh, they threaten the development of trade and investment activities. And the most worrying thing is the liquidity of, uh, liquidity of the Bank of Cyprus, um, which is still under uh, resolution status. Uh, when the second biggest bank was resolved, um, the Bank of Cyprus had to inherit the ELA the equity, the emergency liquidity as instance, uh, which um, was 9.4 billion of the second bank. So the possibilities for further borrowing are extremely limited. 
<coughs> Today, uh, my president is with Mr. Bragi in Frankfurt, trying to find uh, a viable and lasting solution to improve uh, the Bank of Cyprus liquidity. But despite the initial shock of the government, of the population, and the island's uh, business community, we are making serious efforts to overcome this, uh, this situation and to adapt to the new conditions. And it's good that we have not yet uh, experienced uh, serious uh, social unrest. I was in Cyprus yesterday. Um, of course, something that uh, you might not be able to understand, uh, but it, I think uh, at the end it helped, is the weather. It was 35 degrees. Uh, people were sitting outside uh, having their coffee. Uh, the atmosphere is more promising. And uh, as uh, the tourist prospects, we are getting, uh, we have very good prospects for this year. Out of solidarity, I don't know the reason. Uh, of course, uh, I don't know you, if some of you have been to Cyprus, but uh, uh, the waters of Cyprus are the cleanest waters in the uh, European Union, according to the uh, statistics. So um, we remain committed to implement uh, uh, the program that was decided uh, with uh, the Troika in March. It's not going to be easy. The aim is to, to have a smaller but more transparent and resilient banking sector and to return to our, uh, the path of growth and also job creation. We are using, in that regard, all available means and resources uh, another promising development are the gas findings in the exclusive economic zone uh, of Cyprus. Uh, we will begin this month um, the second um, confirmation, so to say. Uh, it's a process, uh, and this uh, process will confirm the findings or not. Uh, it will confirm the volume of the findings or not. And it's very important because if you have this confirmation, then you are able to pre-sell uh, the rights, which is very important at this stage. Uh, according to the first uh, estimates, uh, just in one block or in the uh, offshore zone of Cyprus, uh, the gas findings are estimated to be around 7 trillion cubic feet, just in that block. So now we are going to have uh, this confirmation. Now, from this process, of course, there were some lessons uh, to be learned. First of all, it's important to establish the banking union. We are on the right path. We already agreed to establish this single supervisory mechanism. We need, of course, to implement it. We, want, we need a European framework for the resolution of financial institutions. And we also need to establish a single resolution mechanism which will complement the SSM. Second uh, lesson learned is that action needs to be taken as soon as it is recognized that the country is in need of financial assistance. Delays are very costly, not only for the countries involved, but mainly for the people. We fail to see the bigger picture, not only us, but also the European stakeholders, because um, they should have been more demanding from the then government and not uh, waiting for our elections. Uh, we also identified in the decision-making process of the European Union some deficiencies and some gaps, and we need to revisit this. So this is this why we have the need for completion of the uh, economic and monetary union. And finally, we need to respect uh, the, EU role, uh, the EU rules. Because if you remember, the first decision of the Eurogroup uh, affected also the, the small depositors. And there is uh, a directive of the European Union which calls for the respect of the small depositors, that means under 100,000, and the Eurogroup collectively took such decision. So uh, this shows that uh, we need to <coughs> be careful. So the case of Cyprus was a result of an 
unprecedented economic crisis that hit the whole European Union. This led to a number of decisions that we are not facing before. Of course, it was difficult to face these decisions because our politicians, uh, our public opinions were not prepared. Sometimes they knew what, is, what was right, but was not politically feasible. This is a problem we face a lot in the European Union. And I can give you as an example the bail-in that was applied in Cyprus already before a decision at the European level was taken on this matter. So we felt, and Cypriots uh, felt as part of an experiment, and as a result, they seem to be losing confidence in this project. But I do hope that uh, with the recovery, even with the slow recovery of the economy, uh, the results, um, uh, I mean, the, the situation will change, and the public opinion trust in the EU will be restored. And uh, allow me to say one word on the gap between North and South. Uh, a lot uh, was written during those days and weeks uh, about the case of Cyprus, about the Russian oligarchs, about the money laundering, which, by the way, I mean, Cyprus has better records than, uh, than uh, if I'm politically correct, but uh, in the European Union, we are very frank and open, than Germany, for example. Although there were many reports in the German press, in the German media, about money laundering in Cyprus, but according to the reports interna of, of international, international reports, Cyprus has better position. Uh, of course, there are also none other factors that need to be taken into account. But I'm giving only this example because um, it's the perception sometimes that uh, uh, we, we cannot understand, we on the south, in the south, cannot understand how the north thinks of us, and in the north they cannot see how we, we, we act. And, um, I will conclude by uh, giving you a very simple example. When I, I was ambassador in Paris, but I served also in Germany. When I had a business lunch in Germany, and it was not uh, as an ambassador, so I had more free time, uh, it lasted one hour max, and during that hour, we had our first course, our second course, maybe some coffee, that was it, it was very business-like uh, lunch. When I had uh, lunch uh, in Paris with um, my colleagues from Get Off or Elysee, they lasted minimum two, two and a half hours. We had champagne, for who I believe, a bottle of wine, <laughs> <laughs> and at the end it was also a business uh, lunch. But okay, I mean, this shows the difference in mentality. It, I, I'm not saying that the Germans uh, are right or that the French are wrong, but uh, I mean, we need to, to put ourselves in the shoes of our partners in a, in, to be able to see uh, more clearly and to establish a better understanding of our, among ourselves. Thank you very much.